So welcome everyone. Um, this is a lunchtime panel hosted by the Maternal Substance Exposure Database, also known as Maddox, within CPQCC. Um, you should see a poll up on your screen. So if you haven't voted yet, go ahead and vote. Here's a bit of a brief overview of what we are hoping to offer you today. Um, so I'll go over about, in about five minutes our Maddox database and some definitions. Uh, and then we'll spend the bulk of our time with some pre-submitted questions for the panelists. We also will have time at the end for some live questions with the panelists. So go ahead and as you watch and listen and engage, submit some questions for our panelists through the Q&A box. And then I'll spend the last five minutes offering you two resources that we'll hope um, you'll be able to walk away with. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll now. Um, and share the results. So just so you can see, 85% of you have seen, heard, or experienced stigma against mothers with substance use disorders or infants who were exposed to substances in utero, um, which is a huge reason of why we are having this conversation today. The Maternal Substance Exposure Database, Maddox, is an optional and free database that's part of CPQCC, the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative. Um, and so by collecting data on all maternal substance exposures, so including but not limited to opioids, we aim to improve healthcare for exposed newborns by focusing on treatments and length of stay in the hospital. So the database is designed to capture information on infants who have been exposed to opioids but a lot of our members use it to collect data on infants who have been exposed to different substances as well. So this is a screenshot and you can see some of the indicators that are collected on the Maddox data site. This is a snapshot of what the report page looks like for Maddox. So currently we have about 27 participating hospitals across the state and over 450 infant records that have been entered um, mostly in the past two years. So this data is used to drive improvements in care provided to those exposed infants through a range of reports. So we can help hospitals identify areas of high performance and lower performance, monitor the effects of improvement interventions, and even conduct research um, that will advance the quality of care. So Maddox is available and free to all CPQCC centers, but you do have to request access. So if you'd like more information on Maddox, um, send me a message in the Q&A with your email, uh, and you'll also have a chance to submit your email in the evaluation survey for today's panel. So today you've shut up, um, so maybe you already know what NAS is, but just in case you're a little new to the conversation, I wanted to clarify a few terms. NAS is neonatal abstinence syndrome. You may have also heard of NAWS, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. NAUS is the more preferred term, and so that's what you'll see moving forward from most of the federal agencies, but we recognize that a lot of people still use NAS or NAS, so we'll be using that today. So NAS or NAS happens when an infant is exposed to substances in utero, such as opioids, and then shows signs of withdrawal in the first few days of life, and it can present in a lot of different ways. Um, so today we are going to be talking about stigma and NAS. So we also think about stigma more broadly to include all mothers or pregnant people with substance use disorders, not just opioids. Data on meth and other substances is less clear, but we know that those families likely experience the same feelings of stigma as opioid exposed newborns. Here's a picture into NAS rates for California. So the darker the blue, the higher the NAS rate per 1,000 births. And then the counties that are circled in red have the highest incidence rates. When we look at the situation at the national level, um, we really get an idea of how much has changed over the past three years. So from 2008 to 2017, you can see many states are beginning to fall into the darker blue categories with higher rates of NAS. So that brings us to what is stigma. So stigma obviously isn't just relevant only for um, NAS or for substance use disorders, but I really appreciated this definition that says that it's an attitude, a belief, a behavior, or a structure that manifests in prejudicial attitudes about, 
and discriminatory practices against people with substance use disorders. So this can look like blaming someone or shaming them um, or just a simple lack of empathy for someone. But more importantly, it leads to a host of other issues like lower quality of care for those with a substance use disorder, limited access to treatment over criminalization, feelings of shame for the person with a substance use disorder, and feelings of loneliness and social segregation. So with NAS, we often think about this stigma that the mother or pregnant person might experience, but unfortunately, the stigma of addiction can be transferred to the newborn as well and result in lower quality of care, which is why today's panel is so important. Just as a reminder, please submit your questions for the panel in the Q&A box and we'll address those in the last 15 minutes or so of the panel. Uh, I'm gonna pass it off to Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Chi. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Maternal Exposures Group and I am excited to introduce our panelists who I uh, have all had experience uh, with stigma and to help us learn a little bit more about it. Um, so first off, uh, I have Jen Godfrey. She is the mother of a former NICU infant and continues to help the NICU as a family support specialist. As she helps provide support and education to both staff and parents. And she is also a, a woman in recovery. Uh, next, I have Sandy Orlando, as she is also a former, NIC, well, also from the NICU, a former NICU nurse who for the last 21 years uh, has fostered infants and medically fragile, fragile infants, many of whom have had a neonatal abstinence syndrome. And our third panelist is Dr. Marty Wunsch. She is an addiction medicine physician specialist and a pediatrician with a special passion for maternal and, and child health and is the director of the consult and fellowship service where she works. So uh, I wanted to start off by asking each of you what your own experience has been with stigma. I, will, I guess I'll start that conversation. Hi, I'm Jennifer. Um, so I'm in recovery from sub substance use disorder. Um, I've experienced stigma with being, you know, with having a substance use disorder. I, um, some of the experiences I've had are always being asked over and over again when the last time abuse was, um, being questioned suspiciously, um, having to explain my situation over and over again to different healthcare providers or nurses. Um, just uh, like almost feeling like a sense of shamed, being shamed when they're asking about my situation. And, um, and as a family support specialist here in the NICU at VMC, I've also witnessed moms with substance use disorder not being, not, they have not been given a fair chance at learning to care for their child. I've witnessed that. So there's my piece. <laughs> Sandy? As a foster mom. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Sandy. Mom and a former NICU nurse, I've taken care of babies in the hospital setting and in the home setting. Um, and like many nurses, foster parents bring into their experience, their experiences with um, associates or <laughs> members, as well as members of the public. Um, we develop feelings as we're caring for the babies. And often our feelings um, become resentment or judgment against parents if we see an infant that is really struggling with difficult symptoms, both in the hospital setting and in the home setting. And um, I always have to remind myself that I don't have the same feelings for a parent if I'm dealing with an infant of a diabetic mother as opposed to an infant of a mother with an addiction disorder. And I have to remind myself that this is a physical ailment that um, people struggle with and it impacts the way we treat these babies. Thank you for that insight, Sandy. And, and Marty? So I <clears throat> remember when I was a pediatrician 
And I had no training in addiction medicine. I didn't know anything about this. I thought this was an untreatable disease and people never got better. And then I began to get to know women in recovery. And I went back and did two years of intensive training. So I did all this training. Um, and where I see stigma is when, you know, you see that a baby's hooked on drugs. Babies aren't hooked on drugs when they're in utero, they're exposed. But if you describe them as a crack baby or hooked on drugs, then you transfer the stigma from the mom to the baby. Um, you know, addiction is the last disease, one of the last diseases that we can really say, well, it's your fault. And, you know, one of the ethics of the American Medical Association is that we should treat people no matter how much we believe something is their fault, the same. So I've experienced stigma with uh, nurses telling me babies are broken because moms are broken. Um, with doctors telling me, well, she's just going to do it again. Why are you, you know, she's just going to do it again. This is her 11th baby that she's exposed. So it's sort of a hopelessness that I hear on people's part that people never get better. Um, whereas 40% of diabetics and 40% of asthmatics and 40% of uh, people with substance use disorders get better, listen to what they're supposed to be doing, their doctor's orders, and make the behavioral and lifestyle changes that are necessary. So that's kind of my comment. And, and my team knows me well enough that they kind of grab my hand and go, down girl, down girl. Because when it starts, I, just, <sighs> I, very, I, I have a very emotional reaction to this. So that's my comment. Perfect. Um, so I really appreciate that we have so many nice viewpoints um, to get about stigma. And so I wanted to start off with um, Jen and Marty by asking, what do you wish healthcare providers knew about women who are pregnant, obstetric women, uh, with a history of substance use? So maybe we'll start uh, with you, Marty. Okay, I thought we were going to start with Jen. <laughs> I actually would like Jen to go first, if that's okay. okay. Go Perfect. ahead, Jen. Okay. Um, so what I wish healthcare providers knew about obstruct, uh, <laughs> women with a history of substance abuse, sorry, um, is how important positive, reinforce, re, positive reinforcement and compassion are when you're dealing with women like this, like putting, your pla putting yourself in their place. Um, the importance of empathizing with the mom's struggles, um, remembering that this is a... a a brain disease. This is an actual disease. It's not just a choice or a decision matter. Mm -hmm. um, and a big one for me is when moms are just starting to abstain from um, substances, things may not be very easy for them to retain. They're dealing with a lot of emotions, a lot of guilt, fog from the detox. So repetition and time is so important for them you may have to repeatedly teach them over and over again. So having patience is the key to helping these women. Wow, you couldn't have said it better, Jen. Um, <laughs> I wish that um, healthcare providers understood how powerful their shame and judgment is and how much it affects a woman. And alternatively, building empathy and trust and um, is, is really powerful too. Um, I will often run into a doc who, who knows something about addiction and you know maybe they have a family member and they're so powerful um, because they empathize. The other thing that I wish um, healthcare providers would understand is that, or think about it, if you come from a family, you have loved or lived someone with addiction, you aren't gonna be impartial. You're gonna have a feeling and and so acknowledging that feeling is really important and maybe saying, I'm not up for this. I, my husband's drinking more or, you know, my mom died of a heroin overdose and just saying, I, I really, I need to be, my feelings are really strong and I don't think I can be impartial and can I have a little more time? So. So it, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that having the empathy or, or to try to imagine yourself in, in someone else's shoes, how difficult it must be, uh, and that it's not, um, like you mentioned, Jen, a choice. It is, it is a disease that is difficult and is a struggle, um, specifically in 
pregnancy, have there been, um, would you be able to give us examples of, of experiences during pregnancy um, that you felt um, was stigma? For me? Mm -hmm. so, okay, so um, I stopped, so I, my, my, my baby was exposed to substances in the very beginning of my, my um, pregnancy. I got clean at nine weeks. That's a little bit for personal information I'm going to share with you. Um, so going to the doctors and always being asked when the last time abuse was, even though it's documented there in the chart and you're doing everything you're supposed to, I was going to a program, I was getting, um, I was being, uh, they were, I was being tested weekly, you know, for uh for substances and all my tests were negative so they could look at that in my chart as well because it was through PSAP who is which is connected with Valley Medical Center where I was getting my treatment my prenatal care so they had access to all this so when it, whenever I would go in and and be re-screened every single time it I felt judged and mm -hmm. it felt mm -hmm. it felt like why am I doing this like why am I mm -hmm. if they're just if they're going to be so suspicious so can't they see the last test I I just gave them it was um, negative, you know, my tests were negative, all of them were. So it's just, you do feel a little shame and like they, like the doctors don't trust you to do the mm -hmm. right thing. Like mm -hmm. they, so it's hard to build a relationship when there's no trust in the first place. So that's something I experienced, but it wasn't enough to, to make me uh, stop getting prenatal care. It wasn't enough to make me want to do, to stop doing the right thing. I just, <laughs> kept, like, is that right for me and my child? It wasn't about what the doctors thought, you know, so mm -hmm. at least I have that frame of mind. But some of these moms get so overwhelmed with game, with shame and guilt that they don't want to make the right decisions because they're in fear of how they're going to be treated right. or how they're going to be judged. It's very overwhelming. Yes. And, you know, 99%, great comment, Jen. And, you know, almost 100% of our, our people, and I'm, I'm going to use people with pregnancy to be very politically correct, um, since some folks who are pregnant don't identify as women, they identify other gender. So um, people with pregnancy, many, many, many of them are trauma survivors. So if we learn about ACEs and adverse childhood events, and then you add on it, they're most likely genetically from a family with addiction. Um, that's a hard that's a, that's a, if that person has a hard time trusting. Um, I want to make one other comment. Jen, that you said you were clean. Good for you. I never say, good for you. You're, yeah, and you said your urines were negative. And that's great because urines are positive and negative, not clean and dirty. Urine is sterile, okay? We all know that. So urines are positive if they have a substance. They're negative if they're substance free. And so I would never say, Gosh, Jen, I'm so glad you've been clean. I would say, gosh, Jen, I'm so glad you're abstinent. Because if you're clean when you're not using, then you're dirty when you're using. And that's a moral biblical almost reference. I'm, Jen and I have had this conversation, so she knows the person who is in recovery may use whatever language they want. But if you medicalize this and use things like positive, negative, abstinence, you move it more into the realm of other diseases, brain diseases. Thank you. And, and so continuing on that thought, um, in your opinion, how does the stigma of addiction affect a woman's recovery process and her ability to care for her baby? And, and maybe Sandy, uh, we'll start with you on this one. Thank you. Um, I think the stigma, like Jen mentioned, reinforces feelings of low self-esteem. Um, especially if a woman has been through this already. I will never get this right. I'm a terrible person if I can't even comfort my baby, if I can't stay away from these um, feelings of loss, etc. And so the low self-esteem then will possibly um, lead her to either try every single thing that she reads about or she hears about in an effort to possibly comfort a fussy baby or to improve a baby's feeding. Um, she might start in with a cycle that becomes very frustrating and end up withdrawing or possibly skipping appointments. Um, not being honest with the doctors about the baby's symptoms and her inability to 
uh, improve them because she's afraid that she's going to be criticized. And it can start a vicious cycle that I think um, we would rather not see them go down that road because it can lead to feelings of isolation, uh, they don't show up for appointments, withdrawal, et cetera. So Jen, you talked a little bit about this already, that the repeated questions, the repeated uh, testing, and even the words that are being used um, affects your feeling of yourself and, and seems to feel like there's blame or shame being put on you. Um, would you like to add a little bit further to anything Sandy said? Yeah, so um, if there's stigma involved, it's gonna, it's gonna block the ability to be patient and compassionate towards, our, towards the mother. You're not gonna be able to see the positive aspects of the woman that's in front of you or the person that's in front of you that's dealing with this situation or with this disease. Um, so, you know, from personal experience, I can say that I was reluctant to not experience severe stigma, but it's always, there's always gonna be a little suspicion unless the, unless the, the provider is properly trained and in a, in a compassionate state and really wants to help. That's, you know, you know, and then they can build trust with the, with the person, so. It also can affect, what she talked about this, she talked about um, it, how it affects the self-esteem. And I know from my, my personal, my own personal story is that I am super defensive, super defensive. It's been one of the things that I've had to work on constantly throughout my recovery. It's been, something that comes up in my step work every single time I go through the steps. And um, it's something that I'm, it's gonna be a constant, it's gonna be a con it's something that I have to constantly work on because of all the stuff that I've been through and all of, all of, the, all of, the, um, all of my trauma, I'm very defensive. And so we have to remember when people have been stigmatized and treated badly, and they're going to be super defensive, they're going to be um, defiant. And um, being compassionate and patient and working through it with that person can open up doors to beautiful lives for these people. You know, just being patient with somebody, letting them get that out, um, talking through it with them. So, sorry. <laughs> no, I appreciate you opening up um, your, your heart and your history to us. Um, it really helps us to under, understand how we, how we can help from here on further. And, and Marty, maybe um, you mentioned when you when you first uh, were exposed to uh, uh, persons with substance use, and then you began your your fellowship. Um, what is? Can you talk a little bit more about the difference, maybe, that you have experienced in in how you approach patients and how that may affect their recovery and their ability to care for their children? Sure. I just want to reinforce before we say anything else how mm -hmm. incredible it is to have Jen on this panel. Yes. And it's it's just great. And it's like any other area of medicine. If you're a diabetic and you're a nurse, you're gonna understand your diabetic patients. Um so um I'm a classically trained pediatrician, but I'm an anthropologist, and so I've always been interested in culture and race and the effect on medicine. And I cut my teeth working with uh, um, a couple of Indian nations as a young pediatrician. And I knew my patients really well. And so I knew my moms who were in recovery and I actually opened a treatment home as a pediatrician for native women. Um, and so even before my fellowship training, um, I began to shift my attitudes. I just, I can never stand it when people are being judged. It doesn't matter for anything. And you have the added stigma that if there's only one thing that's happened good with the prescription opioid epidemic, it's affected white people. And so now white people have a brain-based disease. And before the perception culturally was that people of color, they have addiction because they're lazy, blah, 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 blah. So the shift that happened for me and my fellowship is more knowledge. This is a medical subspecialty. There is a board exam. It is a one to two year fellowship. We have medicines, we have therapeutic things. And so when I walk into a patient's room, I'm bringing in a tool belt and it starts with, hi, I'm an addiction medicine specialist. I'm so glad I get the chance to talk to you today. And the last doctor that was in there was so kind of overwhelmed and I don't know how to help this patient. And that may have come across to the patient as judgmental, even though the doctor wasn't judgmental. 
Um, so I have a toolkit, I have medicines I use. Um, I spend my life, the mom knows what's going on, but if it's a mom that's having a really hard time, I might say to a doctor, just imagine this mom's been living in her car and she can't get to the methadone clinic. So sometimes she uses heroin because she doesn't want to go into labor. And so she is a medically sick patient. And if any, you're treating anyone else who's homeless with diabetes, what kind of, but it's different because women are supposed to be sacred and pure and we have the womb. And so we have to kind of help people recognize that cultural baggage. Anyway, long answer to short question. Thank you. And the next question is uh, from our audience. How does practitioner stigma impact access to health care or access to mental health um, care? Sandy? Along the lines of what Marty was talking about, um, healthcare practitioners that seem to be dismissive, that don't take time, um, can contribute to feelings of stigma, which then in turn would lead a parent to um, possibly skip appointments or avoid appointments or avoid hard conversations because they're afraid of the direction that that conversation might take. They're afraid of um, possibly hearing um, difficult outcomes that might be as a coming up with their child, or they're afraid of hearing that it may be a long road with um, dealing with some of the symptoms, etc. So I think for healthcare professionals, the attitude of respect patients like Jen was talking about, um, putting themselves into the shoes of this person, like Marty was talking about, all goes to an attitude of respect. And I think that that goes a long way to building the trust that this individual is going to need in her healthcare team. Jen, it looks like you had something to add. Oh, no, I was just <laughs> uh, okay. I mean, I can, I have something written down, but um, I when we're on. Um, How does stigma affect access to health care? You had talked about um, yeah. when during your pregnancy with the repeated tests that some moms might decide, you know what, I don't want to go back to my visits anymore. I don't want to be asked again, but but you felt um, you, you wanted to continue for the sake of yourself and your baby. And so you uh, continued through your pregnancy to have those tests and, and to face those questions, which is difficult. Um, but it, it sounds like, like Sandy mentioned, that sometimes um, families choose that they, that, that it's something that they feel they, they don't want to continue to fight against. Um, do you want to speak more to that? There's also the fear of the unknown. Fear of going to the doctor's appointments and then taking your baby away or hmm. notifying CPS. Like there's so much unknowns, like you don't know what's gonna happen in those situations. Um, I know most healthcare providers and practitioners want what's best for mother and child. I truly believe that they have the, the, the best interest at heart. Um, I just feel that moms that are using and that can't, don't know how to stop when they go into an appointment and they're feeling judged and there's stigma involved because of whatever reason um, may, that may be, um, the patient's gonna withhold information. They're not gonna be completely honest, so there's no trust there, and they're not gonna get the proper health healthcare or treatment that they need because they're withholding information. Because usually when they're with substance use disorder, there's always, there's, like, I don't know the statistics, but there's usually mental health disorders as well. So, and moving, uh, continuing on from that is knowing what you all have described of what stigma feels like, how it affects patients want to continue with their health care and their trust in uh, the providers. How can we as providers 
how, what can we incorporate into our practice, into our behavior to try to reduce or avoid the stigma? Mm -hmm. Maybe Marty, yeah, if you could start. <clears throat> I think the most important thing that we all do as healers is instill hope in our patients. Hope for my diabetes is going to be better. Um, hope that, um, and hope that they're going to, you know, overcome the obstacle obstacles. You know, there's not really if you want, we don't have a lot of treatment that's tailored to pregnant people. It's extremely expensive. Jen was talking because it's very intense. Jen was talking about mental health. You know, if you're using alcohol, you're going to be depressed. And if you're using a stimulant, you might have a psychotic break. And you might not have those underlying, but drugs cause, and, and, and the label is depression due to alcohol, not depression. So you've got, we have to instill hope. If you don't, as a healthcare provider, if you don't know what to do, if you don't know how to give an injection, you look it up. If you don't know how to do something, you call a consultant. And so one of the reasons I'm real hot on training, we have 91 fellowships across the country, is every doctor and every nurse should have access to this information easily. We're not there yet. So just remember, you can instill hope or you can destroy it. That's my most important thing, I think, in this area. And, and Marty, is there a place as, as physicians that we can go to start to learn to be receive more of this training that you talk about? Sure. Um, Not all of us can do a fellowship, but no. where could we just have a start? Yeah. So um, uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine gives conferences. Um, my fellow, my addiction medicine fellow is going to do grand rounds on this very topic, stigma, racism, neonatal opioid, neonatal. Um, and then you know, there's tons of stuff online. Um, there's the, I can, I can send links to the physician clinical support system. The California Society of Addiction Medicine has lectures. And now, it is now a requirement in medical education residency. Students are now required to learn about addiction. It's a, now a common program requirement, so it will get better. Stay curious, stay open. Every, within the Kaiser system that you and I are in, we all have treatment units we can send people to and work with. But outside, you put addiction lectures into your browser as a doc, lots and lots comes up. Yeah. Sandy, is there anything you recommend from your experience that, um, Practitioners can change in their behavior or in their practice to reduce stigma? Well, um, it starts, I think, often in the hospital setting or probably while a mom is getting prenatal care, um, setting the tone for, as Marty talked about, this disease process and getting a better understanding. I'm able to pivot. Um, to a better understanding after taking a class about maybe seven or eight months ago that updated my information on addiction. I would look at classes that would involve the symptoms, how it affects the baby. And this time I specifically chose a class that was dealing with addiction as it affects adults. And it was eye-opening eye for me, not because I hadn't heard this information before, but it did reinforce and update my knowledge. And that was like a light bulb turning on in terms of my attitudes. Um, I think in the world of foster care, we are often um, encouraged to build relationships with the moms of the babies that are in our care. Depends on the case, um, but it also depends on the information that we we have received about the baby from the hospital to begin with, and also from the social services people. And I think that uh, they set the tone, and oftentimes the information that we get filters to us, and then sets us up for having feelings that can um, create stigma. So I think that the professionals that are dealing with the moms 
in prenatal care, setting the tone and educating the professionals that will be caring for the baby. And then the social workers um, all working together is where we will get the most progress in terms of updating our information and then just um, establishing these ideas of respect, hope, like Marty talked about. Um, I think user-friendly clinical settings are really important, and I think that VMC's program through the March of Dimes that Jen is involved with is a big help because um, she's been there. She's talking to these moms, but she's also um, modeling this behavior for the staff. And I think that that is really um, a program to be duplicated. Um, and then I also think that programs that follow these babies up in the home, Valley Medical Center has the bridge program where nurses will go and um, assess the babies who have had difficult NICU stays and um, going into a patient's or to a parent's home, observing them, caring for the baby, assessing the baby's physical status, but also taking the temperature of the mom in terms of how she's doing, I think is really important. So these are all some things I think that um, are, give signs of hope and collaboration is really important. Thank you. And Jen, I, I know Marty mentioned before that words that, that we use can make a difference. For example, saying clean or dirty versus positive or negative screens. Um, can you talk more about words that you hear or actions that practitioners may have that, that change your trust and what you might recommend we do differently? Um. I mean, when you're, I mean, it's not so much, I know we want to be polit politically correct and uh, change the t t terminology to be more medically directed. Um, I don't think it affects, it didn't really affect me as much because I'm in, the, I'm in recovery and that's how we talk in recovery, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really it, what I feel would help, um, for healthcare providers is if they just have like a designated person that supports this fa family through their pre this this family through their prenatal care through their 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 stay if they're if they're in like what we like what I do in the NICU we support our moms through their their NICU stay we help them we help guide them through this because we've been through it so we know what kind of what it's like we know what emotions they're feeling like having somebody there to help guide them like someone they, they can reach out to if needed um, like a social worker or a, a therapist or somebody of that nature only like like that should be like when you have a, a mom that has substance use disorder that should be like an automatic part of prenatal care yes it's a therapist or or some type of counselor they should just automatically have one i don't know if we have that kind of funding or you know i did, it's just not implemented into the system yet but it would definitely be beneficial to have that kind of support for, for, our, fa for our families. And then also it would, um, giving our families time, giving them encouragement and time to adapt mm -hmm. to this, to these, to this, you know, situation. Like it takes time to make de decisions to change. Like to, when you make a decision to change the way that you're living, like it's your whole, it's like a whole, I, I can't even exp explain how, how it feels like you experience so many emotions and so much mm -hmm. and so and then you walk into a doctor's office and you're being stigmatized when you're trying to make the right choices it's like it's disheartening it mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. so. you know Jen, i think you bring up a really good point and 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 the reason that i encourage patients or doctors to use medical terminology is because then they think of it as a disease yes instead of a moral weakness right um but I think you make such a good point about having mental health support. And we're all talking about moms who are seeking recovery, who are seeking abstinence. But what about that mom who continues to use? 
and it, it comes into the, the hospital intoxicated or in some sort of withdrawal. That's a challenging patient too. And that is the patient that causes the most sig stigma for everybody else. And so um, having someone who has the understanding of, like you do of how difficult that it, this is. And you know, these babies cost us a ton of money. And so we should have we should have the funding, and I think it's out there, but if you're continuing to use and you're active in your disease, how am I going to get you to come to an appointment, much less, much less engage with a counselor? So maybe you could sort of talk a little about that, because I'm sure you work with some of these moms too. So yeah, we've had moms that they're, sometimes they're just, um, it's not their time. They're, they're, a lot of it comes back to denial denial that they have that they have this disease it denial is the biggest block blockage from getting any type of treatment or any type of help when they're just in complete denial that they have a, a disease the disease of addiction you know and um i see that time and time again but then you also what we do is we plant the seed all i do is plant the seed all i can do is tell them my story what i've been through and how i've managed to get this far um Sorry, my ear started ringing. Um, and um, yes, that's so <laughs> important. Yeah, and then you and then planting the seed. Maybe a year from then they'll they'll right. have figured it out and they'll come back to me like what you said. I don't know. Right. It just stuck with me, and eventually it, it got me to where I'm at right now. You right. know, so it it does it really does work. I've had women come back and be like, just right. that one little thing you said right. to me. You know, I have another job. I work as a house manager in transitional housing unit, right? So I have women that are coming from treatment to live in my house as they're transitioning back into society. And so I, I, I talk a lot with these women as well. And these women are fresh and, and um, new in recovery. And they're just learning how to live like as a, as a, as a you know, in, in society again. And um, I'll like plant a seed with them and show them how I've managed to do it. And they'll come back a couple years later and they're like, oh my gosh, I you were the best house manager. You helped me so much. Like what you said really stuck with me. I just kept trusting in my higher power, just planting little seeds. Like it, it really does make a difference. It might not help everybody, but if you help one person, you're making a difference. So and that's how to look at it. Powerful. And that's what I said about one healthcare provider, one amazing woman in recovery, it, you don't, you have a lot of power. We all have a lot of power. And that's what you're talking about. You're, you're describing very, very clearly. The other thing is, it is not easy to get into treatment if you're a pregnant woman. You're up to your eyeballs in trying to withdraw from your substance or cope with your substance. You may have been engaged in illegal activities. You may have a spouse or a family that doesn't know what's going on. And now you're supposed to get on the phone and go like 1-800, I need help. It's really, really hard. You leave the emergency room when you have a heart attack with like, you know, but you leave the emergency room when you go in for addiction, maybe with a piece of paper, maybe with the right phone numbers on if you're really lucky. And so we, you had talked about planting the seed, starting that, that idea of hope, right? Um, so what else can we do to make it a welcome environment, either in the clinic or in the hospital, so that um, we can reduce the potential for stigma. So we talked. Um, we talked about this. Uh, like I, I think that what that question is asking is um, if we're if we encounter some type of stigma related conversation or stigma related behavior happening around us, how do we? change that or how do we make it better mm -hmm. and um i if i so if i encounter like say if i were to encounter a conversation which it has happened mm -hmm. what i always try to do is i just try to enter the conversation by sharing my own experience with with substance use disorder and by changing the conversation to a positive direction for example like asking like the nurses or the doctors what can we do to better support this mom like um how can we make her feel more welcome so she interacts more with her baby like how do we make her feel um safe here so that she wants to do better so that we can connect with her i that's how i change the conversation so that it goes from a, oh this mom's not doing anything she never comes in kind of stigma conversation into like well what can we do to better support her how can i be how can i help 
how can I, how can I help this mom so that she feels safe and welcome here? That's right. kind of, yeah. Safe is a really important word. I mean, I've heard Sandy use that. Safe is key. And I've had experiences where the NICU staff says, this mom can't see her baby. And I say, why not? Well, she's nodding off. She's on methadone. She's going to fall asleep. I say, A, she just went through an emergency C-section. B, yes, she's taking methadone, but nodding off, by the way, is if you're on the right dose of methadone, she's exhausted. She doesn't have stable housing. And so I have had to put a patient in a wheelchair and put, take her down to the unit and stand there and say, I will watch her holding her baby, you know, because there's such fear about these moms and what they're going to do. And so if we don't feel safe, how can they possibly feel safe? Sandy, did you want to add anything else? Well, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think it goes back to training, updating training about addiction, and then also modeling respectful workplace interactions. And it's between the staff, among the staff, and among the um, visitors. Um, and I think that, that that's basically the key to it. So I, I really want to thank you all for giving your experience. And I know um, it can be hard to describe it. Um, we want to go on to live questions in just a moment. But um, what I'm hearing is that as medical providers, we've been given, as Marty mentioned, a tremendous power, a power to affect someone's health care. And in order to make a difference, pardon me, I'm getting <laughs> emotional after hearing you guys, um, we, we have to develop trust. And the only way we can do that is by imagining what it's like to be in the other's shoes. And that it's not, um, like uh, Jen mentioned, sorry. Lisa, you're it's, wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. not about um, choices, but it, it's, it's a disease like any other that is, can be hard to, to manage. Mm -hmm. um, and just to remember to make the best of the power that we have. Right. You're going to cry. <laughs> You know what? I can tell you're a pediatrician. <laughs> <laughs> what you right, just, so, what, Lisa, what you yes. just did, identifying your emotion is the first thing everybody has to do. If you are angry because someone you love did this one time, you know, get some education. Be honest. This makes me crazy. It makes me angry. Or if you're really sad, being, being you know, and letting... This is really, really important in this process. And thank you for sharing that with us. It's really nice. I think the, what it comes down to is that we all want to help these people, no matter what they come from. And being, becoming educated will help us help them more, you know? So, yeah. so what, what's best for everybody? That's why we became, that's why you guys came into this work, right? And you too. Yes. <laughs> Exactly I think right. we have a lot of um, extra questions from the audience, some live questions, Caroline? We do, yeah. So one of them I think we've addressed, um, you know, that maybe it's easier to have uh, compassion or to feel support for a pregnant person when they come in um, with a baby that's been exposed to substances, but after maybe it's a third or fourth baby that they've had, then, uh, you know, they're still um, struggling with their disease, you know, the support tends to wane. I think, you know, Jen and Marty, you have both addressed this really beautifully and that um, it's in those moments that you say, I'm planting a seed and maybe they come back and it's just not their time yet. Um, I think Marty, someone else also asked a question about the role of your own experience with addiction. And Marty, you've said this again and again, that if you've had someone in your life that's, you know, dealing or uh, has dealt with a substance use disorder, and that that's going to color the lens that you use uh, when you're looking at these mm -hmm. patients and their families. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got to check that at the door and get the training um, to be able to handle it. One of the questions that was also asked um, was, how does the type of substance that was used affect the bias or stigma of healthcare providers when caring for these patients? Who would like to tackle that one first? I can tackle it. Um, so there are two drugs that are teratogenic, in other words, cause terrible, terrible lifelong problems. They are alcohol and tobacco. Um, and, and yet, you know, if you're using methamphetamine or cocaine, 
the stigma is greater. Um, and yet it's for the baby, and Lisa is a neonatologist. Um, so the baby, if a, it, 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 sort of the perceived damage to the baby sometimes increases the stigma, and the perceived damage is often linked to illegality and illegality. We're having a huge upsurge in infants exposed to, uh, uh, newborns exposed to cannabis because it's being pushed so hard as natural. And cannabis is right there behind tobacco and alcohol as being a real problem for the baby. So that's one thing. The other thing is if a mom comes in intoxicated on stimulants and wants to hold her baby, that's a whole different experience for everyone than a mom who comes in sedated because of alcohol or an opioid. So that's going on too. So that's sort of my two cents. That's great. Um, I may just move us along because we do have a lot of questions that I think are, are really important to answer. Um, how do you think facility setting different visiting times for parents um, impact um, the parent? For example, at some facilities, if parents are given really definitive time frames for monitoring their visit, how do you think that that can impact uh, the mom? Um, so they're asking about like visiting policies. Yeah. Um, like if, well, here in our NICU, we have a 24 hour visiting policy. Um, it's one pay one right now because of COVID it's one pay one, one parent per at a time and they can alternate throughout the day. Um, but I think that when they're not, when both parents, if there's, if it's a couple that are together and they want to both support the family, I think it can really affect um, it can strain because one usually it's one parent is the, the person that provides the transportation and things like that. So I think it can be stressful if they're not able to visit at the same time, but I don't really think that's what they're asking about. I think that um, if the, I think that the parent, the, the, the mom should be able to visit at any time if the baby's, you know, are you talking about when the baby's in the NICU or in the hospital? Is that what they're saying? I think that's what they're getting at. And if there are perhaps um, maybe some legal ramifications for the mom only being allowed to visit during certain times um, or you know, needing to be monitored would, while they're visiting. That would be something that CPS usually puts in place. And Marty, you're muted. I think you were saying something as well. I said, oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure about any of that. That's their <laughs> Yeah, specifically when visiting times are limited so yeah. that the parent is being monitored in the NICU. You want, to be, you want to see traumatized people, try social workers. They're very traumatized by the mom that just, anyway, anyway, they're, they're, it's, they have a tough life. I would say if the mom continues to use, someone brought this up, what treatment has she had? Where has it been? Is she interested in more treatment? You know, that's, don't give up. We don't give up on diabetics and hypertensives. Sorry, you've lost one limb, you don't get any more treatment, you know? I mean, and that's kind of, that's something that, yeah. And I think some of the things you guys have said earlier about this, like, uh, you know, creating feelings of judgment or shame, and I imagine that being monitored while you sit with your baby is, is one of those things that can really trigger that feeling of hopelessness or, or shame. Um, the last question that we have time for today is how do we establish a system so that we can share information between addiction programs and the medical team so that we don't re-traumatize the pregnant person by continuing to ask them, when did you last use, or are you in a program, that sort of thing. Um, what have you guys seen that's worked really well? Or maybe you haven't seen one that's working well yet and we still have to create one. Jennifer, go for it. I mean, having a family-centered care team like we have here at Valley Medical Center, I mean, um, um, and also having a social worker that's very engaged and involved, uh, maybe having an, a, a social worker implemented ju for just that kind of work, just for addiction stuff. Yeah. Um, I really don't, I mean, I think we do a great job here at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and our NICU here to help supporting our families, you know, we get we have lots of fam lots of moms that agree to go to program and go to programs and they leave here and they go to their house on the hill and they they get their treatment and 
it's they you we you know we follow up on them and some of them stay clean and they they succeed you know so um i think that we have a good system here i mean it's uh, i really I, I really do i mean because we're not going to get all of them we can keep trying but sometimes it's just it takes what it takes to get you there right you know and it really yeah. has to come to a point where you when you've played the tape out so many times and you know what's going to happen if you use again like you're going to end up homeless with with like that's what always happened to me i always ended up with nowhere to go no money no no friends no nothing homeless like just trying to find a place to stay and um when you played that tape out so many times and you finally figure out that that's what's going to happen if you use again you start to want to make changes if you don't want to go back to that place but there's a lot of things that can keep you in that cycle like abusive relationships um um like I'm bad sure environment at home yeah. things like that like that can keep you in those cycles like where you just don't have a you're like pulled back into it so i you know there, there's so many reasons that people don't get it you know and it usually has a lot to do with their home environment or the people that they're around um because uh, if you don't have supportive people around you, you're not going to make good right. decisions. So right. when you have people around you that are doing the same thing that you're doing, you think it's okay and you're going to keep doing it, you know? So I think that this is, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I think that the system we have here at Valley Medical is really, really good. But I think that if we had a social worker that was just for addiction, it, we might have more, a better outcome. You know? Well, we have to clone you, Jennifer. Okay, that's all there is to it. Um, <laughs> Specifically, what needs to happen, and it takes time, is there needs to be a consent signed by the mother so that the addiction treatment program can speak with the OB. Nobody wants to do it. It takes a lot of time. But if someone like Jennifer said, look, let's, let's stop the 49 questions every time you go and will you sign this? And there are some physicians, there are some psychiatrists who practice addiction medicine who have very high walls on this. But more and more, there's addiction psychiatrists and addiction medicine docs who understand this. Also, you might be in a system like within Kaiser Permanente, we can all speak with each other legally, but we need to tell patients we're gonna do it. But it's like any other problem. If you're managing a diabetic, would you not talk to the endocrinologist <laughs> and the endocrine nurse? So, um, so that's the one comment I have to, to say about that. Thank you so much. Um, so in our last two minutes, I'm just going to quickly share two resources with you. Um, this panel has been just so insightful for me. I think we have a lot, uh, you know, more deeper understanding and appreciation of the importance of this topic today. Um, there's two resources, one of which I've already put in the chat box, nastoolkit.org. This was put together by the Mother and Baby Substance Exposure Initiative. It has 39 best practices in it around NAS. If you search for stigma, you'll see best practice number 37 come up. And it has so many amazing resources and links, um, you know, whether it's around specific trainings or empathy trainings that you can use for your staff. Uh, you can use that in your next staff meeting today um, or specific language to use or to avoid. The second resource, and I'm linking it here in the chat as well, <coughs> 15 minute video from HMA just came out in November. It's 15 minutes long, it's amazing. It's called Stories from Mom. So if you go to addictionfreeca.org resource library, you can search Stories from Mom that will pop up. It's hearing firsthand stories like we did with Jen today that I think is so critical in order to break down our own stereotypes that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, engaging with these moms really enables us to increase our level of empathy um, for <coughs> pregnant people or people with infants with NAS and provide more compassionate care. Uh, for those families and for their infants as well. This is something that you can share. You can watch it over lunch. Um, you can watch it in your next huddle, your next staff meeting, but this is a great resource um, and it's something I really think we should uh, broadcast more widely. Um, Carolyn, there's one, yes. there's, there's one video that you sent us that's Dr. Kip, uh, Tipu Khan, who's actually- uh, That's this video, yes. That is so good for a doc to watch. And is that it's in great. there somewhere? Yes. So that's okay. the one that's linked in the chat. So that's the new HMA video. I've linked to the Vimeo. So that's if you go to addictionfreeca.org and search for okay. stories from mom, that's the video that'll pop up. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about the Maddox database, please send me an email. I mean, one of the first things that you can do is to start monitoring 
how you're treating these infants and their families. Um, so please send me an email or send me a chat. Uh, we do have an evaluation that you'll get sent out for today's panel. Please submit that, take two minutes so that we'll know what you appreciated, what you learned, and what you'd like to see in the future. Uh, thank you so much for prioritizing this conversation today. Um, and it's been an absolute joy. So thank you to Lisa, uh, to Sandy, to Marty, to Jen. You've been extraordinary and we have so loved hearing from you. Thank you for letting us have time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.